That's okay with you, Andy, if we record it. Sure. <laughs> I know you guys are mad. You need to count down, right? <laughs> so if you would give us maybe two spare minutes just to get sure. this one on the other side, and then we'll do the countdown. How are we going to do the countdown? Ten seconds, right? In the Japanese. I guess the rest are probably online, sure. watching from home. Yeah. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our small session of uh, How Life is in Space. Um, some of you may have already met uh, Andreas. Uh, he's been here uh, since uh, Sunday, actually, but Monday uh, in the building. Uh, Andreas is originally from Denmark, and you already mentioned we have a very, very international uh, audience here today, right? Uh, which is great. I like that kind of stuff. And uh, when Andreas came here uh, to do his training for this week, I had the idea to maybe ask him if he could give us a little bit of an overview um, because this gentleman is uh, a rare species. He's actually been out in space, you know, and he will be there soon again. And what better opportunity for us to, you know, listen to what he has to say and maybe ask questions afterwards. And uh, he kindly agreed to address. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your- Oh, my pleasure. Here. And without further ado, I have to, to hand it over to Andreas. And thank you very much for doing this. And you guys enjoy it. Thanks. This is uh, just going to be an informal talk. So if you have questions, you know, as I'm speaking, don't hesitate to, to, to ask and I'll answer them. Um, I've thrown in another few slides that are a little different than I normally do simply to, to tailor it to you a little bit, especially some of our Japanese colleagues here, because we do have a, a Japanese astronaut in space at the moment uh, that I know quite well. And of course, I'll try to relate it a little bit to uh, to aviation or at least some of the training that I, I'm doing with with band here in, in upset recovery and aerobatics. Um, but I always like to start with this slide because to me, this um, picture summarizes what I find so fascinating with space. This is a picture I took from Cupola for the International Space Station. Cupola is our window module. It's, it's actually seven uh, windows. Um, that together form kind of a, a, a half sphere, and then you can sit in cupola and, and look out at our beautiful planet. And that's where all astronauts love to spend their free time looking at the Earth. Um, and then typically when they come back from their mission, you know, they show pictures that they've taken from cupola and talk about what a, a beautiful sight it is to see uh, the Earth from space. And it is uh, truly beautiful. Um, but what I found uh, at least just as beautiful was sitting in cupola and then looking out at the night sky, uh, because when the space station is on the uh, dark side of the earth, on the night side of the earth, and you turn down the lights on board the space station and you give your eyes a few seconds to adjust to the darkness, you suddenly see billions of stars. I mean, billions and billions of stars. It's very impressive. And you very quickly get a sensation that, or a feeling that the universe is incredibly large, almost infinitely large. Um, and then at the same time, you get this feeling that the Earth and every one of us on Earth is just a very small part of something much, much larger. Um, and to me, that's optimistic in a way. It's also exciting because, you know, in my mind, something is as big, almost infinitely big as the universe or even just the Milky Way galaxy. It must mean that there are so many exciting discoveries waiting for us in the future and so many dis uh, exciting opportunities 
for us out there. I mean, it's just incredibly vast uh, space. And, um, you know, even though more than 50 years ago now, when Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon, he said it was a, a giant step for mankind um, or small step for man, a giant leap for mankind, S you know, seen, seen in relation to the distances within just our own solar system, you know, what we did 50 years ago was, was take a very, very first small step. And we've only just begun the exploration of space. And so I'm certain that in the future, you know, there are so many exciting discoveries waiting for us uh, out there. Um, and it's, it's really, especially now, it's a very, very exciting future that we're, um, that we're approaching. Another thing, um, you know, on this picture that you don't tend to notice is the Earth. Um, and that's another important point to make is that space exploration in many ways or space flight in many ways is just as much about the Earth as it is about space. You know, we tend to associate space exploration with everything that we can see in the night sky above our heads, but it's also actually uh, about the Earth and our own planet. Um, and that's something we actually discovered back in 1968. This is the uh, iconic photo called Earthrise that um, the Apollo 8 crew took uh, over Christmas in 1968. Apollo 8 was the first mission to leave Earth and to orbit uh, the moon. They didn't actually land, but they orbited. Uh, and then when they came around the dark side of the moon, they saw the Earth rise and they took this uh, incredible photo. And the ironic thing about the Apollo missions, you know, in many ways we went to discover, we went to the moon to discover the moon, but in many ways we ended up discovering uh, the Earth. And uh, this was the first time that any human had ever seen our planet you know, from outside. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, have been impacted by this. I think the, the modern environmental movement has, has, has uh, also been impacted by this because we really see what a unique uh, planet uh, the Earth is. The Apollo missions were also what initially fascinated we, me with, uh, with, with space flight and, and kind of um, gave me this dream to become an astronaut. And for me, it goes way back to the mid, mid to late 80s, back when I was in fourth, fifth and sixth grade. And when I learned about the Apollo missions and the NASA astronauts uh, of the 60s and 70s, that's really kind of when my fascination with space also started. And even to this day, you know, I think the most incredible thing that humans have ever done is, is to land on the moon. I mean, I can't imagine anything more exciting than landing on the moon and opening the hatch and stepping out into this unknown world and being able to explore. Um, so that's where my uh, dream originated from. Um, back there, you know, in the mid to late 80s, that was also uh, about the time that uh, Top Gun came out. <laughs> probably all seen the movie, but I thought that was really exciting as a young teenager. And it fit really well with this uh, dream of becoming an astronaut because typically that's what you know people did. They became fighter pilots, they became test pilots, and then they became astronauts. And that's kind of what I imagined myself doing as well. Um, but then something happened. Um, I started becoming fascinated uh, by science and engineering as well. And the first time I, I kind of understood what science uh, was all about was in seventh grade when I learned about uh, something called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, so this is uh, a ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's where of two of Earth's tectonic plates move apart. You know, so they, they split apart here. And as they split apart, uh, molten magma rises deep from within the Earth. And then when it reaches the, um, uh, the, the seafloor and it meets the cold water, it freezes and it forms new seafloor or new new crust. And the interesting thing about this magma is it um, contains iron particles. And these iron particles, they align with Earth's uh, magnetic field. And so they point in the north-south direction. But when you look at this seafloor, you can see <laughs> distinct bands where these iron particles point in opposite directions. And it shows clearly how Earth's magnetic poles uh, have switched places uh, throughout history. And when you measure how quickly the plates move away from each other, then you can estimate uh, with how many thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years uh, the magnetic poles have, have, have swapped places. And this was the first time when I heard about this in seventh grade where 
kind of a light bulb went off and I thought, wow, that's actually really exciting, you know, by making observations of the earth, by thinking about it, doing experiments, we can understand things as complicated as the magnetic field and how that changes and, and things that have happened from, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I just thought that was fascinating. You know, and this is something that we're still uh, studying. Um, you know, if you look at how often these uh, magnetic poles have uh, uh, have switched places, you can tell see that we're overdue for for another swap of the north and south pole. Um, and of course, that's something we're very interested in in understanding. And so, ESA actually has a current uh, a mission currently in space called Swarm, which consists of three satellites flying in formation uh, that studies. Uh, Earth's magnetic field and how it varies with time and how it get, how it's impacted by things like uh, uh, solar uh, solar storms and the solar wind, um, and then also how it changes with time. Um, and when we look at the data we currently receive from Swarm, we see that Earth's magnetic field is uh, moving quite rapidly at the moment and also losing uh, some strength. And it could suggest that you know in the next say ten thousand years, I know that's a long time for us, but on a geological time scale, that's pretty soon. Uh, the uh, magnetic field poles might swap again, um, and of course, that's interesting because we don't really know what that means for Earth, or we don't really know what it means for 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 life on Earth, or how that process happens. So, a lot of interesting things uh, coming out of this mission currently. When I got to high school, uh, I kept studying uh, physics, especially in astronomy and. I got more and more fascinated. And one of the things that really fascinated me then and, and still does today is this idea of what the universe is made up of. You know, if we look out at the universe and we count everything that we can see, everything that we call ordinary matter, so the matter that you and I are made of, the matter that the building is made of, we think that makes up about 5% of the universe. So then there's about 25% of the universe that we call dark matter, and then the remaining 70% we call dark energy. Why do we call it dark matter and dark energy? Because we don't really know what it is. And so we call it dark because we have to call it something. Um, but I think this is, again, exciting because when we only know 5% of the universe, when 95% of the universe is still sort of unknown to us, it must mean that there's a lot of exciting discoveries waiting uh, to be made in the future. And of course, this is something that we're also still studying uh, at ESA. Uh, in the last five to 10 years, we've had two separate missions. Herschel and Planck um, uh, with the purpose of, of understanding how the universe was formed and how it's um, evolved since, uh, since then and, and, and what it's uh, made up of now. Uh, so this is also still a very active area uh, of research that we work with at ESA. At, uh, you know, in, in high school, I also became fascinated uh, with the, uh, the planet Mars, which is a a fascinating planet, I think. And uh, this map shows what's so interesting about Mars and why everyone's sending robots there. Uh, you might have heard, you know, we've NASA has launched per, uh, or landed Perseverance rover. China just uh, landed a rover. The United Arab Emirates um, also launched an orbiter uh, to Mars, and hopefully ESA uh, in the next couple of years will land a, a rover as well. What's so interesting about Mars? I mean. Part of it you can see from, from this map. So this is a, 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 a map that shows the surface height of Mars. So it's made from radar altimeter data. Um, and one of the first things you notice is in many ways, Mars is, is made up of two different um, spheres. There's the Northern sphere and then the Southern sphere. So the blue colors correspond to low elevation areas and then the red uh, and white uh, correspond to high elevation areas. And so you have this low elevation area to the north, and then this high elevation area to the south. And in the northern hemisphere, uh, this low elevation area, you see a few, few craters, but not a whole bunch of craters, at least not compared to the, you know, the southern hemisphere here, is really pockmarked, uh, full of craters. You know, in many ways, this reminds us of Earth. On Earth, you know, we don't see a lot of craters. You have a beautiful crater here in Arizona, um, but apart from that, there's not a whole lot of uh, craters, and that's because we have weather erosion. So once a crater forms on Earth, you know, after a few tens of thousands of years, maybe 100,000 years, it gets erased again. 
Uh, on the moon, we have lots and lots of craters because you don't have wind or weather or water. And so once a crater forms on, on the moon, it's almost there for eternity. Um, statistically, there ought to be just as many craters up here as there are down here. So that must mean something, there's been some kind of process that has erased the craters from the Northern hemisphere. And that could be potentially water. It could also be maybe lava from these gigantic, you see a, a row of three volcanoes here. This is the solar system's largest volcano. Olympus Mons. So it could be lava, uh, but actually it's, it's more likely to be water. We have a lot of uh, other evidence that points to the fact that there's probably been flowing water on the surface of Mars, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of years ago. And that's really interesting because we think water is a prerequisite for life. So maybe if there was water uh, once on Mars, maybe there was also life. Probably not intelligent life, but you know, maybe bacteria, microorganisms, simple forms of life. And that's, of course, one of the biggest questions that we work with uh, when it comes to space exploration is this question, are we alone in the universe? Is there life uh, anywhere else? And that is one of the key reasons why we're so interested in, in exploring Mars and hopefully one day sending astronauts to Mars um, to, to, to search for, for, for life. And as I said, uh, hopefully, um, well, and hopefully next summer, I think ESA Europe will launch this, uh, this rover uh, to help in that uh, search for life. Uh, so this rover ExoMars contains a drill that can drill uh, a few feet into the, into the ground and analyze the, the soil and, and look for signs of, of simple life on Mars. So by the time I reached high school, my fascination for science uh, and especially for uh, space exploration was so big that I knew that that's what I wanted to work with, even if I couldn't become an astronaut. And so I kind of gave up my dream of becoming a, a, a fighter pilot. Uh, I figured, you know, the chances of becoming an astronaut are, are pretty darn small. Um, so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd rather be, become an aerospace engineer and help build spacecraft and satellites and send them into orbit uh, if I, can't get there myself. And so that's what I decided to become. I became an aerospace engineer. Um, uh, I did a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin and I worked uh, for a couple of years. And then in 2009, I was lucky enough uh, to be selected by the European Space Agency. Um, you know, in Europe, we don't have a whole lot of astronauts. We're six active astronauts at the moment. Um, I started in 2009 with five other uh, Europeans the class before us started back in 1992. So there was a, a 17 year gap between our class of astronauts and the, and the previous uh, class. So you have to be really lucky that you're the right age and the right phase of your career. Uh, the good news is we're currently looking for a new class of astronauts. <laughs> so if any of you are interested, uh, you can apply. You have another 10 days. The deadline is the 28th of May. Um, if, if you're still too early in your career to apply, the good news is that uh, our goal now is to select astronauts every six years. So probably pick a smaller class, maybe four astronauts this time, and then hopefully do that every six <laughs> years from now. So you don't have to wait 17 years like I did. <laughs> um, but, you know, even, even today, I still get fascinated and inspired uh, by, by what we do in space. Um, it's become really popular to tell take selfies. This is one of the coolest selfies ever taken, I think. This is a, a European spacecraft called Rosetta. That's, uh, well, it's no longer in orbit, but it was orbiting a comet called 67P. Um, and it took this picture of its solar panel. And then you see this uh, comet that it's orbiting in the background. And if you look closely, you can even see this jet of gas that uh, the comet is spewing out. Uh, a really cool picture, I, I think. Rosetta was launched all the way back in 2004, it then spent 10 years traveling through our solar system uh, before reaching this comet uh, and then entering orbit, studying it, taking incredible pictures of it uh, before it ran out of energy and, and, and crash landed uh, on the comet. This uh, was our class of uh, astronauts from 2009. Uh, there I am looking really young. This is uh, Alexander Gerst, uh, my German colleague. We were here in 2011 and got our, uh, our PPL here. Uh, everyone else uh, was already a pilot. Luca uh, was an Italian uh, fighter pilot and test pilot. Tim, uh, a British helicopter test pilot. Um, Thomas, 
uh, was an aerospace engineer as well, uh, and then uh, joined Air France as a pilot and flew A320s. Uh, Samantha, also an engineer who then joined the Italian Air Force and became a, uh, a fighter pilot. Um, so that was our, our class in 2009. Yeah, so ESA, the European Space Agency, um, is, is separate from the EU. So um, any, any European country can choose to become a member of ESA. And so uh, the UK is a member, Switzerland's a member, Norway is a member. Uh, so there, there's some overlap, but there are EU countries that aren't members of ESA and there are ESA member countries that aren't part of the EU. Yeah. So that, that shouldn't hopefully affect our... Uh, collaboration with the UK. I've already given you a bit of an idea of what we do by uh, through some of the different missions I've, I've, I've talked about, but at ESA we do a lot of, of stuff outside of uh, human spaceflight and astronauts. You know, you, you can kind of think of, of what we do in four different areas. We have science and exploration, uh, where we're studying not just Mars uh, and, and astronauts in space, but everything to do with our solar system. Um, then we have all of our application services, which include uh, the European version of GPS called Galileo. So we have our own satellite navigation system, um, you know, telecommunication networks, uh, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, we're also starting to do a lot of work within uh, safety and security, uh, protecting our uh, space-based assets, uh, not just from orbital debris. I mean, the more we launch, the more debris we have in orbit, but also protecting it from, from solar storms and other uh, solar system events that could impact, uh, uh, impact our, our space-based infrastructure. You know, the more reliant we become on things like GPS, the more vulnerable we also become in case we suddenly lose GPS. I mean, could you imagine if, if suddenly GPS was turned off tomorrow? You know, well, most of us probably couldn't <laughs> couldn't navigate in our cars down the road. <laughs> I mean, we'd become so reliant on, uh, on just pulling out our phones and, and, and being told where we need to go. Um, and of course we have our, our Ariane rockets uh, to send a lot of these uh, satellites into to space. Just to give you an idea, um, compared to NASA, NASA, I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but roughly NASA has a, an annual budget of about uh, 20 billion dollars. Uh, so ESA's annual budget is about uh, six and a half billion euros. So maybe seven and a half billion dollars. And it's only a, a small portion we actually spend on astronauts, less than 10%. So about a quarter of our budget we spend on Earth's observation. And that's also one of the reasons why I said to begin with that space exploration is just about just as much about the Earth as it is about um, about space and what we see out there. Uh, at least for us. You know, a quarter of our budget is spent on satellites that uh, help us understand Earth uh, and and uh, understand the climate and, and and how different processes on Earth change. But of course, the part of ESA that I'm concerned with is uh, currently the International Space Station, um, and that's really been the focus for the last 20 years or so is this International Space Station, which is just an incredible place to be. It's the biggest, most complex uh, structure that humans have ever built, and we've built it in space. It's, you know, it took us 12 or 13 years to assemble it piece by piece. The first piece was launched in 1998, um, and then uh, officially construction was completed, we, we say back, I think in 2011, uh, but uh, this summer, the Russians are planning to launch another module. Uh, and so the space station will continue to grow. There's also talk about a, a private US company called Axiom Space that might launch a private module in 2024. Um, so the space station could, could still change. Um, it's about the size of a football field. So it's about uh, 100 yards wide, about 80 yards long. So this is the back end. Uh, this is the front end, so the space station on this picture flies up towards the ceiling. Um, orbits about 400 kilometers, it's about 250 50 miles at a speed of about 28,000 kilometers an hour or 17 and a half thousand miles per hour, uh, which means it only takes about an hour and a half for it to 
circle the Earth once. Or in other words, in the space of 24 hours, you see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets from the space station. So it's, it's quite impressive, which also means that there's no natural time zone on board. So we just choose to use GMT. Uh, that's just kind of an agreement. So when it's six in the morning in, in the UK, we get up. And then when it's 10, 11 p.m. at night in the UK, we go to bed. But we could use any time system because there's no, no natural day-night rhythm on board the, the, the space station. So for the last, about the last 10 years, the, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft was the only way to get to and from the space station. So the, uh, the, the space shuttle was retired in 2011. Uh, and since, since 2011, until about nine months ago, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft was the only way to get uh, to and from the space station. Now with SpaceX um, and their Dragon capsule, uh, NASA can again launch astronauts from Florida. And we've had two operational missions so far, Crew-1 and uh, Crew-2. Uh, but I flew uh, in 2015, uh, so I flew on, the, on this Russian uh, spacecraft, which is a, a fascinating spacecraft. It was developed back in the mid to late 60s. So this was actually the Soviet version of Apollo. It was meant to take uh, Soviet cosmonauts to the moon. And so it, it actually has the, the capsule here that you sit in during launch and entry. And then you have this orbital module on top where uh, you know cosmonauts were supposed to spend their time on the way to the moon. Now we can spend it uh, on our way to the space station, we can we can sit there if it if it uh, you know takes longer than at the moment we can do we can do a trip to the space station in three hours. Back in 2015, when I flew, it took us 53 hours. So we we were glad we had this extra space up here to to hang out, so we didn't have to stay sitting in our in our seats. Um, but because Soyuz was developed back in the um, 60s, it still has a lot of the of the original analog control systems. Uh, which makes it a really fascinating spacecraft to fly. You can essentially lose your computer and, and most of your electrical system, and you can still uh, return to Earth. Uh, you have two hand controllers that are directly um, connected to the uh, propuls propulsion system. And then you have a, a periscope. It's almost like a submarine periscope here. Uh, and you can look through a, a little window in the bottom of this. And then you can, you know, you can you can control your attitude uh, in the direction you want, and then you can control the firing uh, of the engine, and you can and land back on Earth. So in that sense, it's incredibly robust uh, system um, because it has this this analog system uh, as a backup, and it's just really really interesting to to learn to fly. Um, is this something that has, they have to be using for that the whole time, or are those modules newer versions of that old technology? So, so the first so the first flight was back in 1967. Um, but that module was not reusable. No, so this is not reusable. So it flies once, and then it gets thrown out. Okay. Yeah, and then they, they rebuild it. And they have also modernized it uh, with time. Uh, so they've added, you know, a computer system and... And digital controls, um, but the version I flew on still had as its base layer this analog system. So if you lost everything else, you could uh, return to the analog system and and return home, which was really fascinating to learn about. Um, so we 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 learned to fly. I mean, I say fly it. Of course, it's not really flying. It's in space. You can. Uh, you, you learn to to fly around the space station and do a manual docking. So you. Uh, you know, you can control the, the thrusters, um, and it's, 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 it's really a blast to, to sit in the simulator and learn how to fly around the space station and, and how to dock to the different docking ports. Um, we also learn how to fly it during re-entry. Uh, even though it doesn't have wings, it does have a, a very small lift vector. I think the lift to drag ratio is something like 0 0.3, uh, because the center of gravity is offset from the... Um, uh, from this, uh, the center of gravity is offset from the center of pressure. So you get a slight angle of attack, which means it has a small amount of lift. Um, and when you're, when you're screaming in through the atmosphere at, at uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour, even a lift to drag of 0 0.3 is still a, a little bit. Um, and so we learn, how to, uh, we learn how to fly it by rolling it. You know, so as you, 
as you roll right and left, that big left big, uh, that lift vector will will change direction, um, and that of course has a, a big impact on your on the g-force you experience because if the lift vector is pointing up, you're you're kind of coming in shallow, whereas if it's pointing down, you're really digging into the uh, into the atmosphere. And so to learn how to uh, understand that coupling, uh, you know, a lot of that training takes place uh, in a simulator or in a in a centrifuge like this. Where we're sitting in that capsule and as we're controlling our descent uh, it speeds up and slows down and we, we can feel how how the how the g's impact us um, it's a little bit different uh, because we're we're lying down in our seats we're lying on our backs and so there's no there's never ever a, a really a risk of of passing out because the blood never gets pushed out of your head you just kind of get pushed back into your seat um, uh, but um, it, it's still quite, I mean, it's a lot of G's you could, if you do it wrong, uh, on, a, on, a, on a ballistic entry, if you just, so if we go uncontrolled, uh, we can switch to a, a ballistic entry where the, the spacecraft just kind of continuously rolls down through the atmosphere. And that way we kind of null out the lift vector. And in those cases, we get up to about eight or nine G's uh, during re-entry, um, which, yeah, it's it's not dangerous, but you get, I mean, you you, you feel it. Uh, and another thing, um, you know, when you fly on Soyuz with the Russians, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether or not you can you can adapt yourself to to space uh, and to avoid space sickness. You know, when when you're in space and you're weightless, your your the, your sense of balance doesn't really work. Um, and so a lot of astronauts, about 60, maybe even 70% of astronauts uh, get some kind of space sickness. It's essentially a form of motion sickness. Um, and so there's a lot of debate about whether or not you can, um, you can uh, kind of learn how to, how to uh, uh, cope with that. Uh, the Russians think you can, and so they, they ask you to sit in this chair and you spin around and you move your head from side to side, uh, which is kind of interesting uh, feeling as soon as at least for me, as soon as I closed my eyes and I started moving my head from side to side, I, I got this sensation of, of uh, being on a swing, but doing kind of a figure eight. Um, and then they, 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 they put you there until you basically can't take it anymore. But <laughs> I, think, I think I won the battle with the doctor because after 15 minutes, he walked out of the room and then they stopped it and that was it then. <laughs> so... But yeah, it's it's very very individual. I, I'm not sure you can really gain a whole lot of you know a lot from it. It's and it's also very hard to predict how you're going to react. You know, some 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 people throw up after a minute, and, and some people don't ever really get any um, any ill effects from it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe he's cleaning up. I don't know, but yeah, it's it's space space motion sickness is is kind of interesting because there are, there are astronauts who will get car sick or seasick, and then they'll get to space and they'll never feel any ill effects from it. And there are others who have never been car sick or seasick before, and then they get to to space and you know they're they're vomiting for a week, say. So it's. It's, it's almost impossible to predict. This was the crew of the International Space Station uh, up until a couple of weeks ago. So this, is, this was crew one. So this was the first, these four in the front, uh, the first four uh, to fly on SpaceX Dragon, uh, launching from uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, they came home about two weeks ago now, I think. And so there are seven people left on board the space station. This back row, that's crew two. Uh, they launched uh, start of April also on SpaceX Dragon. And then these three guys in the middle, uh, they flew uh, on the Soyuz, they launched also in April. Uh, so we have twice a year, we have Soyuz flying to the space station. And then twice a year, we have um, either SpaceX or hopefully in the future Boeing as well. Uh, they're also building a, um, a capsule for NASA. And uh, hopefully we'll have the, uh, an unmanned test flights later this year. And then maybe within the next, I don't know, six months to a year, we'll have the first 
uh, manned flight of, of, of Boeing Starliner, it's called. But currently seven people on board the space station. Uh, not sure if any of the Japanese colleagues in here recognize Suichi Noguchi and uh, Aki uh, Hoshide. Um, I think there are seven Japanese astronauts currently active, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, one of them, Takuyo, uh, Takuyo Onishi, uh, started also as a uh, working for uh, ANA, and I think flew seven six sevens before he got selected. Also in in two thousand and nine, at the same time I did. Um, so I know know all of them quite well, especially Suichi. I've spent uh, by coincidence I've done a lot of different training with him. Um, you know, some of the training we do is is underground in caves. You know, one of the challenges we have is we can't go to space to prepare for space. We can't take an instructor with us. So, the, you know, the first time we go to space, it counts. It's, um, it's, and so we try to find what we call analog uh, environments here on Earth that in some way resemble the challenges that we might face in space. And so one of the things that we do is we, we train underground in a, in a cave system in Sardinia uh, where we live for a week or two weeks at a time. Uh, a couple of kilometers underground. And in that sense, we, we get to experience some of that uh, disorientation of being in a completely alien environment. Um, you know, underground, you don't see sunlight at all. It's pitch black. And so you lose the day night rhythm that you also lose uh, in space. Um, and it's just a, a very, very, uh, in, in, yeah, a very, very incredible experience. Um, so it's, it's really underground mountaineering almost. You can see us repelling. Um, in real life, it doesn't look at all like this because it's pitch black. The only reason you can see anything on this picture is because we've set up cameras to, to flash at the same time we take the picture. So in that sense, it's a little bit misleading because we're, you have to imagine us doing this in pitch darkness. The only thing we have is the headlamp uh, on our helmet. You know, if, if that battery goes out, we lose all light and, and we can't do anything until uh, we've got new batteries in our in our headlamps. It's really, really a good training exercise. And we, we were six astronauts um, on the mission that I was on, uh, and one of them was Suichi. And I also spent uh, a week underwater uh, with Suichi. Again, just a coincidence. We um, went on an underwater mission to um, the Aquarius habitat. It's, it's off the coast of Key West. It's a... Um, it's an underwater laboratory that NASA uses also to train uh, astronauts to get ready for space. It's uh, at about a depth, of, I think, of about uh, 30 feet or so. Uh, and after a couple hours at that depth, um, you know, you, 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 you can't just descend to the surface. Uh, you, it took us, I think, 16 hours of decompression to return up, uh, up to the surface again after uh, a week underwater. Um, and again, you know, in that type of environment, all, you know, safety is the top focus. And then that's the way we, we kind of learn to, to work in the same style or fashion that we do on board the space station. Um, you know, if there's a fire on board this laboratory, you can't just open the window uh, just like you can't in space. And so it's, it's a way to train um, and prepare for, for space without actually going into space. Um, but an incredible, exciting mission uh, to be part of, really to, to have a chance to live underwater uh, at 30 feet for a week is, is really incredible. And so that, by the way, this is, this is our toilet. <laughs> so it's basically a, a, a bell with water. So you, you, you take a deep breath and then you, you swim over here and you pop your head in there and there's an, uh, an air bubble. And then you, you quickly pull down your pants before the, the fish come. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a really, really interesting uh, thing to be part of. So is there also water inside the, the model of the space station? Or... No, here? Yeah, yeah. No, so this is a, no, this is a, it, it, it's about the size of a school bus. Um, it's, it's a laboratory with bunk beds in the back, then you have a kind of a living area, and then you have a, a wet dock here in the front. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if you remember the old James Bond movies, um, where you just have a, you, you kind of have a moon pool, uh, with water. So the pressure inside of, of this living quarters is the same pressure as the water. So that keeps the water out. 
and, and so you just have this this moon pool and you you know you walk down a few steps and then you're in the water yeah. Yeah. and that's all of course to to prepare us uh, for the uh, international space station um, you know most astronauts at the moment we, we typically spend six months at a time on board uh, the space station so uh, the crew two that launched here in beginning of april will will return to earth i think uh, sometime in beginning or mid October is uh, the planned return date. Um, I mentioned the space station flies uh, or orbits the Earth at about 250 miles, but even at 250 miles, there's still uh, a tiny bit of, of atmosphere left. Um, maybe atmosphere is the wrong word, but there's still some air molecules at that height, enough uh, at least. For the space station to feel a form of drag or air resistance which causes it to lose energy and uh, descend uh, or fall back to earth by itself and if we were to do nothing uh, in about maybe a year and a half two years it'd come crashing back to earth so every every maybe six months or so uh, we we boost it uh, we we can use uh, some rockets here in the back end or we can attach a spacecraft at the back end uh, and boost it back up uh, into its proper uh, height. And I have a video, uh, which I want to show you because it's, it's really a fun video, I think, uh, that takes place during one of these reboost maneuvers. So where the, where the engines at the back uh, are lit and, and we're lifting the space station back up into a higher orbit. He, he makes this look very easy. It's not that easy at all to do a backflip and not crash into the wall. That was what Satoshi used. Very impressive backflip there. <laughs> One thing you can also see, these are our four, four closets in a way. These are four sleeping stations we have. Um, when you're weightless, there's no such thing as up and down. So it doesn't matter if you're sleeping on the floor or the ceiling or the walls. It's like a little closet you can step into and then sleep. No, nothing. Yeah. It's a division. You know what you're trying to do. So if you close your eyes, you wouldn't even know what you're trying to do. No, no. I mean, so actually, a really interesting thing happened right after we docked uh, to the space station. So, you know, 53 hours after launch, we arrived at the space station, we dock, uh, we open the hatch. Uh, and then there's a tradition that you have a, a like a little press conference after you arrive, and so um, you know the 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 astronauts that were on board the space station uh, they they told me okay we've set up the camera in the next module you know just make a right and then we'll get ready for this press conference and so right after opening the hatch I you know I flew in and then I flew to the right uh, into what's called the service module which is one of the main elements of the space station. It has a lot of the computer systems and control systems. It's a module I've spent a lot of time training in. And I get in there and I couldn't recognize anything. And I thought, this is really weird. Like, 
either I took a wrong turn or <laughs> I haven't been paying attention because I couldn't recognize anything. I, I, I thought I'd, I was lost on board the space station. Um, but one of the uh, one of the astronauts, I think, could see kind of my look of bewilderment. And he said, well, it's because you're standing on the ceiling, right? And so as soon as I flipped over and I got my feet back on what we call the floor, you know, at least what's the floor here on, in our module on the ground, everything kind of fell into place and I could suddenly recognize where I was. But just being upside down, which, I, you know, just by coincidence, the way we had docked and the way I had come, come in through the space station, I happened to be flying along the ceiling instead of the, of the floor and everything looked different. I, it was really, really strange. Um, it's a little bit like those, um, yeah, so, if, you know, so if we're walking, if we're working, you know, if we have our feet on what we call the floor and we're working, and then we suddenly, you know, you know have to do something else and we flip over, um, it's a little bit like those, you know, black and white pictures that you look at, you know, if you look at it, it it's, you know, it, one second, it looks kind of like an old man, and the next time it looks like a, a vase or something like that. It's a little bit like that when you flip upside down, everything suddenly looks weird. But if you just kind of close your eyes and then open them again, then suddenly you've gotten used to that the ceiling is now the floor and then things look uh, the same again. But it's just that little transition because you don't feel it at all. It's, yeah, there's no such thing as up and down. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, the purpose of the space station, of course, is, is uh, science and technology development. And we spend a lot of time doing all sorts of research in physics, chemistry, biology, material science, or anything that you can imagine um, we, we, we work with on board the space station. One of the big topics is human physiology. Um, you know, if we one day want to send humans to Mars, uh, which is a mission that's going to take two and a half or three years, uh, then we need to uh, understand what happens to our bodies in space, because a lot of things do happen when you're weightless. You know, you tend to lose muscle mass, you tend to lose bone density, your immune system is compromised, your eyesight is impacted. Uh, so a whole wide range of, uh, of, of, of things happen uh, when you're weightless. Another thing that happens is that you tend to grow a little bit. Uh, some astronauts, when they're weightless in, you know, over the period of six months, they might grow two, three, four inches in height. Um, it's not permanent. So if anyone thought that that's a good way to get taller, <laughs> It's not permanent. You return to your normal height as soon as you're back on Earth. But when you're weightless in space, uh, you tend to be a little bit taller than, than normal. And it's probably because, you know, your, your spine is no longer supporting the weight of your head. Uh, and so kind of like a, a spring that, that elongates when it's no longer under pressure, your, your spine elongates and, and, and you tend to grow. Um, but it can be problematic because it can give you back pain. It can increase your risk of, uh, you know, disc problems later in life. Um, you might also not be able to fit into your spacesuit, which is uh, tailor-made to you. Um, and so one of the things that, that I tested was a, a suit like this, kind of like a wetsuit that tries to minimize uh, the, the elongation of the spine. Um, another thing that we spend a lot of time doing uh, is exercising, because exercising is one of the few ways that we have to mitigate the loss of muscle mass and bone density in space. And so we can either uh, bike, like I'm doing on this picture. This is our exercise bike in space. We also have a, a treadmill, and we also have a, a strength uh, exercise device where we can do almost anything from squats to bench press, uh, curls, uh, anything you can imagine, really. Um, and for astronauts that spend more than uh, you know, a month or more in space, it's a requirement that they exercise two hours every day simply to maintain uh, their, their conditioning. Another thing I had a chance to work with was some, uh, some new technology uh, for uh, rinsing wastewater. Uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge to spaceflight is, is launching things off the earth. And so it's really expensive to bring up resources. And so we try to reuse as much as we can. And when it comes to wastewater, I think we reuse something like 95% of the water. Uh, so all of our urine is collected, all of the you know, the sweat that evaporates into the atmosphere is condensed out and it's treated and it uh, is turned back into drinking water. So we tend to say that the coffee we had yesterday is the same coffee we're going to have tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, of course, it requires a lot of energy and a lot of chemicals to, to, to turn wastewater back into drinking water. Um, and so we're testing a new technology 
uh, based on uh, an osmotic membrane, uh, which consists of proteins, sort of like the proteins that line your blood vessels and that control what passes in and out of your blood vessels. So these are proteins um, that only allow water molecules to pass through the membrane. And so it's a, a, a way to treat wastewater and turn it into drinking water uh, without having to use chemicals or energy because it's, you know, it's the membrane itself that, that filters out anything except uh, the water molecules. And so it's so obviously a very interesting technology for, uh, for, for space flight, but also here on earth where we also have a, a need uh, to, to treat wastewater in a cheap and efficient manner. Space station, of course, is also a great place to, to observe the Earth and the atmosphere uh, from. And uh, another experiment I was asked to participate in was uh, um, an experiment, a small experiment to um, photograph and film giant lightning. Uh, we also call them blue jets and uh, red sprites. Um, and these are, are really giant lightning that shoot upwards from the top of thunderclouds and out towards space rather than down towards the ground. This is something that um, was only discovered maybe 25 years ago by accident. Some, some graduate students had set up a camera somewhere in, I can't remember if it was Utah or, or, or somewhere uh, in, in, here in the West. And um, you know, they were filming something else, but when they looked at their, their camera the next day, they could see out on the horizon uh, a thunderstorm and they could see these flashes on top of the thunder clouds. And they thought that's kind of interesting. Um, and so that's something we're, we're trying to study and understand better. Um, and I was asked to, 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 to do a little precursor experiment. There's now, well, since 2018, there's now a dedicated experiment on the outside of the space station uh, consisting of cameras and, um, and uh, X-ray detectors uh, that study these giant lightning strikes. Uh, but I was asked to do a little, just a simple experiment uh, with a, a normal camera and to see if I could film some of these, uh, these blue jets and, and red sprites. And I have to admit, I was a little bit skeptical because I'd never seen one before. And I thought, what are the chances that I'm gonna see one while I'm in space? Um, well, how come you never see them when you're flying in an airline? Like when you're above the uh, thunderstorm, I've never seen one shoot straight out. Really you should, yeah. And I, I have, uh, ever since uh, my mission, there are a few pilots that have, have sent me some photos that, that look like some of this. So. I, the thing is, we don't know how often they occur or how rare they occur. We don't know under what conditions they occur. Uh, so this is really a, a, a new area. But yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely possible that that you well you should be able to see them um, if you're a, if you're flying at that altitude. So um, yeah, it's something to 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 keep an eye on in your careers at least. I yeah. Uh, so one, one evening um, after dinner, I was sitting out in, in Cupola, our window module again, uh, just kind of relaxing, enjoying the view. And then off in the horizon, I could see this, uh, this thunder, uh, thunderstorm develop, and it was really a, a gigantic storm. Um, so I quickly grabbed my camera and I started filming as, uh, as much as I could. Um, and this is one of the pictures I took here. You see just a, you know, a standard thundercloud lit up by, by white lightning that we know from Earth. Um, and here we see some of these red sprites um, shooting up. And then most impressive of all, as I looked through the photos afterwards, I also saw this. I didn't see it in real time because it, it happened so quickly. And there were, I mean, this, this storm was just gigantic. It, most windows in the cupola were just full of lightning. And so I was just kind of filming as much as I could. Um, but afterwards I looked through it on my computer and I came across this and it turned out I'd actually caught it uh, on video as well as it, as it was pulsating. And I have a little video of it here um, that I'll show. And I, I've slowed it down and uh, enlarged a little bit so you can see it again here. And then once more, even slower and even larger right there. So it's really, really impressive. Um, and it turns out that um, it's actually the first time it's, it's been 
film. So a very new phenomena that we're still learning a lot about, but uh, definitely something to, to keep an eye out for if you're ever flying above thunderstorms. Um, it's probably the most impressive part of my mission was to, to see this. And if I go back, I'm definitely going to try to <laughs> look for more. Uh, but as I said, we now have a dedicated experiment that, uh, that, that studies this, uh, these phenomena. Um, this is where I was. So this is the cupola that I was talking about, uh, this seven windowed uh, half sphere that we can sit inside of uh, and really enjoy uh, the view of the Earth. You know, the Earth, well, the space station is, is so close to the Earth that if you were to look out just one single window, uh, you would see such a small part of the Earth that, that you almost couldn't recognize what you were looking at. Uh, a lot of people have this idea that if you go into space, you know, to the space station, you see the Earth as this blue marble, kind of like the Apollo astronauts did. Uh, but to see the entire Earth out of a window, you need to go, you know, maybe a quarter of the way to the moon. You need to go really far away. Uh, the space station is way, way too close uh, to the Earth to be able to do that. Uh, but thanks to, to Cupola uh, and, and thanks to these windows that, that let you look out at the horizon, you, you almost get a sensation that you're seeing the entire Earth uh, as the uh, Apollo astronauts did. And if you're small enough, you can even lie down in cupola like this. And it's just an incredible place to spend your free time looking down at, uh, at the Earth. And so you can imagine if it was just a single window, you know, you'd be seeing this and, and it can be really hard to, 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 to understand what you're looking at. But thanks to these uh, windows that allow you to look uh, sideways out towards the horizon, uh, you almost see the Earth as an entire uh, sphere. Cupola, the purpose of cupola is not just to uh, make astronauts happy. Um, it's actually our, um, it's, uh, it's, it's from where we can control our robotic uh, arm. We have a, a 17 meter long robotic arm that we use uh, to install experiments on the outside of the space station uh, to repair things that break, uh, but also to catch some of these unmanned cargo vehicles that come up. Uh, so they, uh, these are unmanned vehicles full of, full of cargo. Uh, they typically approach to a distance of about 10 or 11 meters. And then it's the astronaut's job to use the robotic arm to grab them and to dock them to the space station. So that's the, one of the primary purposes of Cupola. But we're not, when we're not working in there, we, we love to spend our, our free time. And it's just incredible uh, what you can see. So this is my home country of Denmark. Again, I wasn't expecting to see uh, Denmark from the space station during my mission uh, because um, so Denmark, the latitude of Denmark is about, well, it's, it's more than 50 degrees north. And the space station only just comes up to about 51 degrees north. And so it's only when the space station kind of reaches its most northerly point and then begins its, its, its uh, uh, southward journey again that, that we can see Denmark uh, from the space station. And then I have to admit, it's also very seldom that it's uh, clear skies in Denmark. Denmark is not like <laughs> Arizona. Typically, it's full of clouds. <laughs> yeah, Von Hart, that's right. Von Hart, and then uh, Schellant with Copenhagen here. Yeah. But yeah, one, one day, you know, I, I looked out the window, and it was perfectly clear, and, and we happened to be flying over Copenhagen, or over Denmark, and I was able to, to take this picture. And there's something incredible, not just with seeing your home country, but with seeing the Earth. You know, you're one of the first things you notice really is the contrasting colors between the, the blue ocean, the white clouds, and then the, you know, the pitch black uh, space that surrounds us. Uh, and then you, you also quickly notice this thin blue line up here, which of course is our atmosphere. And maybe because the earth looks so big and space around, surrounding the earth looks so big that that blue line looks fairly thin. And you, you maybe because it looks so thin, you get, an, you, you start to feel that it's, uh, something you you have to to take care of because if you know if that blue line disappears and there's no more atmosphere left and without an atmosphere there's no life on 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 Earth. Um, but yeah, it's a, a very distinct blue line of atmosphere that you see surrounding the Earth. Another thing you you quickly see or you quickly notice uh, when you're flying over the day side of the Earth, like on this picture, is that you don't see signs of life. You don't see signs of humans. 
You can't see roads, buildings, cities. Uh, you can't see borders between countries. And so you really get uh, an impression that the earth is, is uninhabited and you know, peaceful. Um, you also begin to, to realize that, that borders in many ways is, is something man-made. These is, are, are artificial in, in, in some way because there's no, no borders when you look at it from, from, from outer space. And it's not until you, you fly over the night side uh, of the earth that you even see signs of, of humans. Uh, on the night side, you can see all the lights from the big cities light up and it's also a, a, an incredible sight. So this is uh, the Iberian Peninsula with the Mediterranean Sea and then North Africa uh, in the distance. And seeing the earth from, uh, from space also sometimes gives you uh, a deeper understanding of, of life and of civilization. You know, we all understand how important water is to life. Uh, but when you see it like this, you suddenly really understand it. This is Cairo with the Nile River, you know, and you, you see how everything is built up around the Nile. You know, you go a little bit left or right of the Nile and it's just dark, there's nothing there. And that's, again, you know, just really shows you how dependent uh, we are on, uh, on water. You know, this picture um, also gives a, a, an excellent understanding of, of our modern world. Um, it's a little bit hard to see what exactly we're looking at, but this is from right to left. This is the Korean peninsula. So we've got South Korea with Seoul. We have the demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel. And then we have North Korea with Pyongyang and then some, uh, some Chinese cities here along the border. Um, but this, you know, this is really incredible to see the difference between North and South Korea and how much has changed in the last 50 or 60 years. You know, you go back 50 or 60 years uh, ago, North Korea and South Korea were you know, more or less the same. Uh, and now you see the difference, how energy intensive our modern society has become, how much uh, energy we, we, we use. I mean, it's incredible, right? I mean, this whole country is almost dark. Sure. So on the space station, there's, I don't know, a dozen or so people for several months. How does that work if you're together with the same food for so long? I mean, now you're bunched <laughs> up and you're dealing with the same. Like, how, how does that, how do you prepare for that? And how does the training work? So part of, part of the answer is, I mean, astronauts are selected for personality traits that, uh, you know, hopefully um, mitigate some of the problems that you, that you, that you mentioned. Uh, of course, a lot of our training is focused on that. You know, I talked about the caves training. I talked about the underwater training. Uh, you know, there's the, the, the technical part of it, but then there's also the whole uh, interpersonal skills part of it. You know, you're, you're in a stressful environment underground, for example, with six other people for a week. And so we, you know, we learn techniques for how to, uh, you know, to, to, to communicate properly, to um, defuse situations that might escalate. So a lot of our training um, focuses on that. But at the same time, you know, we're, we train for about anywhere from 18 months to two years before our mission with the people we're going to fly to space with. And so it, most of us are friends by that time. You know, we've 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 spent time not just in Houston, but also in Russia, in Germany, in Japan, in Canada, doing all the different parts of, of the training. Uh, and so we, you know, we're often away from our families, and so we're, you know, we're we're having dinner together, going out on the weekends. And so you you there you build up a sense of camaraderie during that training, uh, which hopefully also um, minimizes in any. Uh, personal problems on board the space station. But of course, it's not, you know, you can't avoid everything, but uh, hopefully all astronauts are professional enough to be able to, to, to deal with it. Yeah. But it's <laughs> not, not that I know of. I mean, you know, especially on board the space station, it's, it's six months, you know, you're, you're, 
most most astronauts up there are just so if you look at them on the pictures they've got the biggest smile on their face because they're they're excited to be in space you know they're looking out the window enjoying the view they're they're weightless you know they're flying around like kids basically i mean it's just so much fun to be weightless it's yeah it's it's the closest that humans come to be able being able to fly um and it's really it's really simple you know you just a small little push and suddenly you're flying down through the space station which is 80 yards long you know and, and you'll see astronauts you know flying like that <laughs> pretending to be superman <laughs> it's just fun it's yeah it's and how does it work with like the choice of space like do you get assigned a bunk bed do you have a locker do you get a so um on that video I showed, I, I kind of, it was hard to see, but I kind of pointed out four little closets there. there I mean, basically the size of a little closet. And so everyone, normally everyone has a, a, a sleeping station or this little closet, you know, you can step in, there's a sleeping bag, you close the door and that's your, your room on board the space station. Um, so we, we, we have six, uh, we're bringing up another one now so that everyone has one, um, but yeah. Typically, uh, everyone has their own little private space in that sense. Yeah. And do you, do you get tired just as you do on, on Earth? Because you said there's no natural rhythm of anything. So if you stay on one clock, do you still get tired and you go to your closet and you actually physically be able to sleep? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting. You don't. It doesn't require any energy really to to move about right it's you're, you're just kind of floating there so you don't for example you don't unless you're working out you don't sweat really you just because it doesn't require any uh any any energy i mean you know just the fact that i'm standing here balancing i'm using a little bit of energy uh you don't have that in space um but yeah you could you get tired you need to sleep um but yeah you, your natural day night cycle is disturbed so we you know we impose one we you know we we try to go to bed every night at the same time and wake up at the same time to have that that kind of rhythm uh, for me uh, my my, my mission was a little bit special it was a 10-day mission um and so you know the normal considerations for for the six months you know for a six-month mission is kind of like a marathon you want to conserve you want to make sure that after five months you're still uh, able to work at a decent rate and so for the for the astronauts up there for six months they you know they'll have some days off they'll have the you know tip work will typically stop at seven or seven thirty at night and then they have the rest of the evening off they'll have sunday off they'll have they have to clean on saturdays but you know as soon as they're done cleaning they have the rest of the saturday off in that sense we kind of maintain a a, a, a nice work pace for six months but for me i was up there for 10 days so you know, I, I was working 10 days straight for, you know, I was, yeah, I don't know, 12, 14 hours per day just to get all the work done. Um, so I was exhausted when I, when I went to sleep, I, as soon as I closed my eyes, I was asleep. Yeah. But I know a lot of astronauts will say that, uh, you know, they miss the sensation of, of lying down in a bed or the sensation of having a pillow. Yeah. yeah. So some, some astronauts will try to tie a pillow to their head. <laughs> Um, yeah, as I said before, it's just, you know, it's beautiful and you could spend hours and hours in Cupola looking uh, at our beautiful planet. Um, and even though there's not a whole bunch of craters, there are a few craters here. Here's a crater in, in Canada uh, that you can see from the space station. Again, the, the stars and then the, uh, the auroras, which are just incredible, not just the green auroras, but on top you have the red colors. It's just, it's really, really uh, beautiful to, to look out the window. And of course, we see, uh, see a, a lot of interesting phenomena, including uh, volcanic uh, eruptions. And again, because we have the ability now to look out sideways through the cupola, we can see things in, in, in sort of more three-dimensional way than, than if you're just looking straight down at something flat. And so you can see volcanic eruptions like this and how the ash cloud is formed and develops really impressive i think this this series of photos really get a, a feeling for the size of this 
Ash cloud. And then, of course, weather phenomena. This is a, a typhoon in the Pacific Ocean. You know, again, you, you really get an, uh, an impression of how big and powerful some of these storms are. I mean, just look at this, this eye in the middle. It's just, it's gigantic. And then even though we can't see signs of, of, of humans, we do see things like forest fires, for example, from space. We can see the, the smoke from, from forest fires. And then once in a while, uh, we even see things that we don't really know what are, uh, what, what, you know, what they are. This is a, a structure in northern Africa uh, called the Richard structure or the Eye of the Sahara. Um, here's another picture of it looking straight down. You know, exactly what it is, uh, I don't think anyone really knows. Could, in theory, be a, maybe the remnants of a crater impact. It could also be maybe an underground cave that somehow has collapsed on itself, um, but very, very impressive. Hopefully, it won't be too much longer uh, before astronauts or humans uh, are again able to see uh, the Earth as a blue dot like this, like the Apollo astronauts did. Um, even though we're still working full steam ahead on board the International Space Station, we're already preparing for the future. And we're currently developing a smaller space station to go into orbit about the moon called uh, the Gateway. Uh, the first element of the Gateway hopefully will launch uh, within the next three years, maybe in 2024. Uh, and then the idea is to build up this gateway space station that we can send astronauts to in orbit about the moon, and then potentially to have a, like a, a shuttle between this and the surface uh, of the moon. And so hopefully in the, in the second half of the 2020s, between 2025 and 2030, we'll see the first humans back on the, the moon again. Um, so a really, really, uh, exciting time ahead uh, for, for, for space flight. Um, the space station will continue at least, on, the International Space Station will continue at least until 2024. Uh, hopefully we'll continue beyond that to 2028, maybe even 2030. And then we'll have to evaluate uh, the state of it. Of course, it gets older and older and needs to be, uh, more and more time needs to be spent repairing it, uh, but it's still going strong and, and hopefully we can get another almost 10 years out of it at least. Uh, but at the same time, we'll be uh, starting to send astronauts to the moon again uh, within the next four or five years. So uh, very, very uh, exciting time. Question, does the ESA plan a manned space flight to Mars? And if so, would you volunteer for it? Um, yeah, so the Gateway Space Station is, uh, you know, one of the things we learned from the International Space Station is how important international co uh, collaboration is. And so this is actually this more or less the same partners, NASA, ESA, uh, Japan, and Canada are all part of the Gateway Space Station. And the idea is that, uh, that you know, we're gonna learn how to live further from the earth for longer periods of time. We're gonna develop the technology uh, that'll allow us to, to go to Mars. So. First step, gateway in the moon, and then as a second step, uh, hopefully send astronauts to, to Mars. That's kind of the overall plan. Uh, and that's also what we're preparing with through these uh, robotic missions. So the NASA's Perseverance rover, for example, also includes a uh, chemical um, experiment that uh, is producing oxygen from the Martian uh, atmosphere. And of course that's, you know, part of the techno technological development in preparation for sending humans to, to Mars. And so that is kind of the, the end goal is to send humans to Mars. Uh, but, you know, for the foreseeable future, it's gonna be uh, focus on, focused on, on the moon. Yeah. I don't know if you already touched on this, but um, how does your next mission look like? Uh, what are you scheduled to fly with if already? And um, what's the first thing you you look forward to doing on once you're on the on orbit or in space in general? Um, so I, I don't have a concrete mission yet. Um, there's kind of a, a plan uh, to send me to space again, hopefully. Well, 
most likely in you know the next three or four years. So 2023, 2024 is kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, most likely it'll be from Florida on either uh, the SpaceX Dragon or, or the Boeing Star uh, liner once it gets ready. Um, and I don't, I don't know what I look forward to the most. It's, it's just such a special place that, uh, I mean, it's, it's so much fun being up there. Um, you know, the, the work that we do is really interesting, the science, the technology development, uh, but also the fact that you're with, you know, you're, you're a group of seven people up there that you know well, that you spend a lot of time with, and, and you just, you have fun together. Um, you know, you're working together, helping each other out, you're eating dinner together at night, having fun, looking out the window. It's just the whole, the whole experience is incredible. Mm -hmm. So wh why why send astronauts instead of robots? Uh, no, no, no. Why the NASA send the astronauts to the Mars instead of sending the scientific uh, robots? Well, so you know what I think what we've realized is that you, you need a combination of both. You know, uh, robots are are good at some things, and and astronauts are are good at some things. Especially, you know, when it comes to searching for life, it's uh, it it requires um, a lot more than what a robot can can typically do. Because you know, an astronaut on the surface of of Mars uh, can can use their intuition. They can make observations they can analyze the situations and then they can make decisions and and they just have a much more they have much more versatility than than a robot they're also much more mobile um you know the for example the the the, the later apollo missions they had a this electric car that i showed earlier with them and uh, i think on one of the later missions maybe apollo 17 they were able to cover 30 kilometers um a rover on mars will cover 30 kilometers in like 10 years, simply because they, they're they much more limited in, uh, in, in, in how fast they can drive because you wanna be safe. You don't wanna land a rover on Mars and then have it get stuck on a rock or get stuck in a, in a sand pit. And so you, you, you send a command to the rover, okay, drive 10 meters and then stop and take a picture and then drive another 10 meters and take a picture. Whereas a, an astronaut can, can be much more mobile than than an, than a rover. Do you have a yeah, yes? Uh, before being assigned a specific uh, mission, uh, what can I do? Well, what uh, can you prepare for the next mission? Well, what can yeah. work? So, uh, I mean, when you when you start as an astronaut. Uh, you start basic training. So typically two years of, of basic training to learn uh, all the fundamentals um, uh, that, that are required. Uh, and then after that, then you have an additional about two years of uh, kind of more specific training. So all in all, before you're ready for your first mission, you have about four years of training. Um, when you're not in those four years of training, you're typically doing all of the support functions necessary to, to keep the program going. So, you know, if you imagine all of the work necessary to keep an airline functioning, you have, you know, the schedulers, you have the maintenance department, you have, you know, everything else in terms of certification and, and training and, and, on, and, and all these things, you know, that's what the astronauts help out with when we're, when we're not uh, um, either in training or in space. So I work in the control center as what's called CAPCOM, the capsule communicator, where I talk with the, the astronauts on board the space station. Um, I help to solve things. Uh, you know, things are constantly breaking down and we need a solution. How do we fix this problem? And so I, astronauts are asked to help on that. Um, some, some things as mundane as tasting the food. You know, when we develop new food, we, we, we want to make sure the astronauts like it. And so astronauts are asked to come in, taste this food, do you like it? And, you know, if not, then we'll go tweak it. Uh, new clothes, um, we, we, we test 
We help to develop new hardware. Every time there's a spacewalk, astronauts on, on Earth will, will you know, help to develop it in the, in the big pool uh, where we can do uh, a spacewalk underwater um, in order to make sure everything is, is uh, you know, timed and, and perfectly planned out before they do it in space. And so it's very, very practical, very operational work in support of the space station program. Yeah. So at the moment, uh, I'm based in, in uh, Houston, Texas. So the, the European Space Center has an astronaut center located in Cologne, Germany. That's where uh, all the European astronauts are based. It's where I lived and worked from 2009 until 2016. And then in 2016, I, I came over to Houston uh, to be the, the ESA uh, astronaut liaison to NASA. So I'm currently working with NASA astronauts uh, all, all the same tasks that they do, kind of being the liaison officer between ESA and NASA. Sure. So, um, you know, several years ago, NASA made a decision to try to get private companies more involved and to try to stimulate uh, kind of the development of a, of a space industry. Uh, and so they, um, the, they essentially had companies uh, bid on, for example, developing rockets and, and capsules uh, using their own design. So, you know, before that NASA would, would make a, uh, make a design specification and then send it out and let companies bid on it. Now they said, basically, we just want a, a system or a service to take our astronauts into space. And it's up to you to design whatever you want. And it's your technology. We're uh, in, a, you know, in essence, we're, we're buying tickets um, on, on your rocket. And it's up to you to, 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 to develop the technology, to own the technology uh, and to, to deliver this service. Uh, and that's what, uh, SpaceX, they won a contract. Um, uh, Northrop Grumman won a contract for cargo delivery, and Boeing won a contract for ast uh, sending astronauts to the space station. Uh, and so far, SpaceX has been very successful with their Dragon. Uh, they've now had two manned flights. Hopefully, Boeing uh, within the next year will also uh, start sending their astronauts um, to space. And the idea is that you know these companies, they own the technology, they can they can sell it, they can do with it what they want. Uh, and so um, already SpaceX has announced two private missions. For example, they've announced a mission called Inspiration4, uh, which will be, I, I don't know the exact details, but I think it's something like a three-day orbital flight, not to the space station, but, but into orbit. So um, four private individuals will launch sometime later this year on a three-day uh, orbital mission. And then, Axiom 1 flight will occur sometime next year, maybe January, February timeframe. It'll go to the space station. So four private individuals will come to the space station, um, I think for about 10 days. Um, and this is something that SpaceX are doing on their own. Of course, if they go to the space station, you know, they have to work with NASA and ESA and the other international partners uh, to, to come on board and you know, to, to be trained for that. But uh, these private orbital flights like Inspiration4, they can do on their own and it's it's part of what they get out of this uh, commercial crew contract that nasa has has instigated and it's all with the hope of of stimulating um you know a, a, a space economy that eventually the goal of, of which is eventually to drive down the launch price because that is the biggest challenge that that we face is, is the cost of launching things into space uh, so the hope is that that you know, private companies being innovative, developing their own technology, will be able to drive down the cost of space access. Yeah. How much of the launch cost? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I I don't know. I mean, SpaceX. It seems to be. Again, you know, just from what I see in the media, SpaceX seems to be doing very well. They're capturing more and more of the commercial rocket, uh, of the commercial launch market. They're launching 
I, I forget they're I mean they're launching almost like a rocket every two weeks now uh, and if you've seen their first stage landing back on this drone ship out in the ocean it's very very impressive to see and they're reusing a lot of the hardware so I assume they must be they, I, I assume they must be able to lower their price and and, and win market share that way It's definitely um, something that Europe feels as, as well. Um, and ESA has just, I think a few weeks ago, awarded three, again, I think three contracts to three different companies to, I mean, nothing significant, but kind of like startup money to, to start developing um, uh, commercial rockets for, for small payloads to, to not, not to send astronauts, but to send uh, smaller satellites into space. FAA. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's all I mean it's it's all new, right? It's 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 basically being developed as we speak. It's um so there's a lot of, you know, the whole regulatory environment is something that's uh, is is being developed. Um but yeah, it's FAA. If you want to at least if you want to launch from a, from the US, it's it's the FAA. Of course in you know, there's international agreements. There's a lot of talk about, you know, if two satellites crash into each other in space, you know, who's who's responsible? There's, you know, all, all sorts of uh, judicial questions like that still need to be solved in the future. I think when they when they when they happen. Thank you. Think about that. You know how many objects, how many man-made objects are in orbit right now? Right over Um. So if we're talking about like functioning satellites, I think it's on the order, roughly on the order of 1500. But then, you know, if we're talking about pieces of space debris, which could be anything from, you know, down to the, a bolt or a nut that's fallen off, you know, several thousand. Um, but, you know, speaking of SpaceX, you know, they, again, I, I, I don't know what their plan is, but again, through the media and through you know what they uh, what they seek approval from for from for example the FAA, you know they'd like to launch a constellation of I don't know like twelve thousand satellites. So if you think of going from fifteen hundred satellites now to twelve thousand in the next couple of years, I mean it's gonna there's gonna be a huge change. But thinking about SpaceX going in there, if I want to fly into the IFR structure, I have to pilot flight plan, so I fit in. Everybody else, how do they know where every other, you know, all the other satellites are, and how do you fit in? I mean, yeah. so this goes a little bit beyond my my knowledge, but I don't think there are necessarily. Well, so I guess it depends on the orbit, right? So there are some, if you're if you're going into like low Earth or medium Earth orbit, so anywhere up to say. A thousand or fifteen hundred kilometers. Uh, I don't know if there's any regulations, but if you're going into geostationary orbit, uh, where you want a communication satellite that's always directly overhead, pointing down at a country, there are very few of those spots. So I think those are probably regulated, maybe by the International Telecom Telecommunications, what's it called, organization or something like that. But otherwise, I don't. I think like if you were to build your own satellite and launch it into space. If you got launch permission from the FAA, I think you could launch it into, there's no, you know, you, you know, you, if you crash into someone, you're going to lose your own satellite. So there, I guess there's kind of an assumption that you're going to be careful and not damage your own satellite. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we always have an, an escape vehicle. It's the it's the capsule that we arrived in. Uh, so the capsule stays up uh, on board the space station with you. 
uh, and that's what you also return to Earth with at the end of your mission. And that was actually the, the whole point of my mission in 2015. I mentioned I was up there for 10 days. The standard is six months. Well, back in 2015, there were two astronauts, Scott Kelly and uh, Mikhail Konyenko, that were up there for an entire year. And so the purpose of my mission was actually to switch out their spacecraft for them because the Soyuz is only rated for uh, just over six months in space. And so halfway through their mission, we needed to swap out their spacecraft. And that was kind of what I did. I launched in the new spacecraft and then I returned in theirs 10 days later and left mine up there for them. Um, so yes, we always have a, an emergency escape. Uh, space debris is a, is a challenge. Um, you know, the US has radars that, uh, that, that try to track as much debris they, they can. Uh, and uh, you know, anything that has a risk of colliding with the space station, NASA is informed. And if the risk is high enough, then we can raise or lower the, the height of the space station to avoid it. Sometimes I think since this, you know, in the last 20 years, maybe on five occasions, I think uh, we've been told, well, the space debris wasn't discovered until it was too late to raise or, or uh, lower the, the altitude of the ISS. And the risk was high enough that the astronauts were told, put on your space suits and sit in your, uh, in your capsule and be prepared to undock in case the space station gets hit. Um, each time we were lucky, nothing happened. And so once the threat was gone, then they could, you know, they could take their spacesuit off again and, and return to normal. But yeah, it does happen. Yeah. I have a question. yeah. What's the smelliest module? And why is it the Russian one? <laughs> so, smell, I mean, you would think the space station smells really bad, right? Because we can't <laughs> air it out. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, smell is something you, you get used to very quickly. So I didn't notice a smell at all. Maybe there isn't really even a smell because we, you know, we have systems that clean the air uh, and that remove all sorts of particulates. Um, the only smell I noticed was right after we docked or if we uh, opened the, the airlock, um, then there was kind of like a, like a metallic smell kind of like a, a burnt, almost like gunpowder. And that's apparently I've heard that's the, that's what happens when metal gets exposed to vacuum space. It kind of gives off this like burnt or gunpowder smell. Yeah. It's the only thing I noticed. Yeah. What do they do with the trash? You said a lot of things are recycled, like water, but there still has to be some amount of trash. Is that brought back to earth or is it just ejected? So the, um, the unmanned cargo vehicles that come up um, after we've unloaded all the cargo, we fill them up with trash and then we send them back down through the atmosphere, uh, but they don't have a heat shield like the uh, man capsules do. Uh, so they, they burn up in the atmosphere. Yeah. So all our trash essentially gets incinerated in the atmosphere. What do you think the most or fundamental ability uh, to be an astronaut? The most fundamental ability, actually, I think what characterizes most astronauts are is a um, sort of a, a generalist, being a generalist. So you're 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 good at a lot of things. Um, you're not necessarily a specialist in any one area, but you know you have a, a wide range of skills uh, that you're 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 fairly good at because that's typically today it's it's what's required of astronauts you have to be able to you know you have to be able to do science on board the space station you have to be able to repair the space station you know, if, the, if the toilet breaks down you've got to fix it you know if, if you can't fix the toilet within three maybe four maybe five days you've got to leave the space station right because we can't we can't live without a toilet <laughs> And so, and you have to be able to go on a spacewalk. You have to be able to 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 fly the 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 um, spacecraft. You have to be able to speak Russian. You know, if you fly on on the Soyuz spacecraft, everything is in Russian. All the radio communication is in Russian. So it's it's just a, a wide variety of things that you have to be able to do. I have a similar question. What's the common and or different qualities between astronaut and the pilot? Oh, good question. Um, 
I think a, there's a lot of similarities, um, which is also why a lot of this, you know, when you apply to be an astronaut, a lot of the selection tests that you have to do are identical to the, the pilot selection tests. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's it, a lot of the skills are the same. You, you need to be able to multitask. You need to be able to, to, to communicate and navigate and, 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 and do multiple things at the same time. Um, yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot of similarities. Um, it's a very operational environment. You know, the way we work is, is very procedure-based, checklist-based, which again, very similar to aviation, um, yeah. which is why a lot of, I think nowadays, about 50% of astronauts come from, from a military background or a aviation background. China pulled, I guess you could say, um, with their booster re-entry. How does that affect like international space community? Like how does that, you know, how does NASA react to it or how does ESA react to it? Well, so that goes back to the, the one of the previous questions about, you know, who who makes the decisions and, and really, you know, there is no kind of international governing body. It's up to every country to to you know, act not only in their own interest, but in, in, in everyone's interest. And that's another thing that we've become much more aware of is, is space debris. You know, if you, if you leave your satellites up there, it's going to affect you in the long term, right? Because it's going to be a, a hazard to, 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 your, to your later satellites. Um, so there's a lot of international collaboration going on to kind of um, to mitigate some of these things and, and, and to improve the, the situation for the future. Any other questions? From a safety management standpoint, what's the biggest risk when flying to, to space? Um, so the, 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 the riskiest phases of flight, launch and re-entry, you know, because those are the, the dynamic phases uh, where there's a, a, a lot of energy change involved. You know, on launch, you're sitting on top of a, of, of a bomb going off, basically. You know, you've got, I don't know how many hundreds of tons of, of propellant below you. And, you know, on, on re-entry, you're going from 28,000 kilometers an hour down to hopefully close to zero, you know? So <laughs> those are the two, the two most riskiest phases of flight. On board the space station, on board the space station, there's kind of three main emergency scenarios that we train for. One is fire, one is a depressurization, and one is uh, an ammonia leak because the, the external radiators that cool the space station are filled with ammonia. And, and you know, if we have a rupture in one of the lines, in theory, we could get ammonia inside the space station. And that's very, very poisonous. So those are the three main emergencies that we, uh, we train for. But yeah, it's, um, you know, the toilet, something as simple as a toilet. If the toilet breaks, if you don't fix it within three or four days, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're going home because it's you can't live without a toilet. <laughs> metric? Yeah. Oh, we do everything. Yeah. So we have we have metric tool sizes and we have imperial tool sizes. Yeah. yeah. And then we cross our fingers that uh, <laughs> that the engineers um, yeah made the right decisions. But it's interesting. So, the, I mean, I, I didn't really go into detail, but if we go back to a picture of the space station, at least for me, it's fascinating as an engineer. Um, you know, you imagine something as complicated as a space station would be designed as a, you know, as a single system, but if you look at the, the history of the space station or the International Space Station program, um, you begin to understand some of the quirks behind the, the, the space station. So, you know, back in, you know, the Russians, after, after, after the US landed on the moon, the Russians gave up sending cosmonauts to the moon and they began 
concentrating on building space stations. So they had the Salyut space stations, then they had the Muir space station, um, and then uh, the US, you know, they had uh, uh, Space Lab, and then um, in the in the mid '80s, they began to to develop um, what they called Space Station Freedom, which was going to be this gigantic 100 man uh, space station in in orbit, really a gigantic thing. Um, and it, it was so expensive that Congress quickly shut it down. Um, and then, so they, NASA then kind of scaled it down into three different different options, Space Station Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, they called it. And then in the early 90s, um, after the breakup of the um, Soviet Union, uh, the US and Russia um, kind of began to look at ways to to collaborate and what came about was the international space stations and so nasa ended up taking their plans for space station alpha and the russians took their plans for mir 2 and then they kind of figured out how they could merge these two together and make one space station which is why there really is you know there's there's the russian half and then there's the american half and on the russian half for example you use 28 volts on the US half, you use 120 volts. So you can't just take a P, you can't just take your computer from one end to the other end. You know, you've got to bring all sorts of voltage converters and, and things with you. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of differences like that. It's, it's, it's really, it's two space stations bolted together in the middle in some way. Yeah. But there is no one big point in design philosophy you could point out between Russian space flight and let's call it other space. Uh, a common or a difference? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there are many ways to solve a problem. And so you, you see that on board the space station. So all the, the Russian modules, for example, are free flying modules. They were all launched on top of an unmanned rocket. Uh, they could fly themselves. This module that will be launched, uh, if everything goes according to plan, the Russians will launch in mid July another module. You know, it'll fly up by itself and dock uh, automatically. And so they have, you know, propulsion systems, they have guidance and navigation systems. They're basically a, a spacecraft that docks to the, uh, to the space station. Whereas, the, the, you know, all the other modules were flown up with the space shuttle. And so they're really just, uh, um, you know, like a cabin. They, they can't fly on their own. They, they don't have any propulsion or navigation systems like that. Um, that's one difference. And so uh, as a practical result, you know, the, the hatchways between all the US modules are big and you can, you can take big pieces of equipment between them, but uh, between the Russian modules, because they're spacecraft, you know, the, the hatchway is like this. So you, you can't really trans move or move anything big between, uh, between modules. So it's much easier, for example, on the American side to, to bring up an, an entire new experiment. You know, we can fly up a, a huge new experiment, install it and throw the other one away. Whereas, uh, the Russians don't necessarily have that same capability, um, but so just a lot of different practical differences like that. Um, let's see, a space odyssey, aliens, and Apollo 13. So this is the classic space space movie. Which one is your favorite? <laughs> so I really, uh, I really like Interstellar. Um, I also really like Contact. I know a lot of people didn't like Contact. I, I thought Contact was really good. Um, I also like The Martian, for example, um, especially the book. I thought the book was fantastic. Um, I also, if you, uh, a TV series called The Expanse. I love The Expanse. This is a fantastic series. If you have, if you like science fiction, uh, definitely go watch The Expanse. Um, yeah, so, Gravity, gravity, pro gravity was probably if, if you want to get an idea of what it looks like when you see the Earth from space, gravity is probably the best movie. It's really, really impressive the way, like the cinematography of it. Um, everything else. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just, there's a lot, the way, when they're trying to be realistic, then, you know, then you ought to try to be realistic. I think you know that there's a lot of focus about on safety. 
Um, and just the opening scene where I think it's George Clooney flying around in his jetpack making jokes, you know, it's, it's completely opposite to the way we work in, in, in space. Yeah where everything, I mean, just like, you know, when you're a, a, a civil aviation pilot, it's, it's all about safety. It's, you know, you follow the procedures, you follow the checklist, and they're there for a reason to, 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 to be safe. And it's the same way we work as astronauts. Uh, as I said, the benefit of uh, express exploration is uh, that uh, we can collaborate uh, beyond the nation uh, nationality, uh, but I think uh, there should be some future for the uh, each country, and especially in Japanese astronauts, uh, there's some future of the uh, Japanese astronauts. Or uh, yeah, what your impression about uh, Soji or? Uh, I, I mean, JAXA is is Japan is one of the you know the key partners of the space station, and they have a. Uh, I think they have seven active astronauts. Um, you know, Aki is up there now. I think uh, Kuichi Wakata will launch next, maybe a year from now. Yeah, and so every, I think every year, maybe a year and a half, the Japan launches an astronaut. And as far as I know, they're they're also part of the gateway. So I'm sure we'll see Japanese astronauts going to the moon at some point. Well, so to launch into space from, from the moment the rocket is ignited until you're in orbit at about 200 kilometers altitude, it takes eight and a half minutes. Um, and then after those eight and a half minutes, the quickest we can do it at the moment, I think is about three hours. Um, and it's, I mean, in theory, you could do it a lot quicker, but, you know, for Again, for, for safety reasons and for, for operational reasons, we establish the orbit, we calculate the, the impulse, and then we catch up to the space station. So uh, I think nowadays the quick is about three hours to get there. And it's probably about the same um, to return to Earth. I mean, we undock, usually we do an orbit to set up for uh, the return. And then the return itself, once the engine starts until you're back on the ground, maybe 45 minutes. All right, any other questions? <laughs> I, I didn't notice anything, but <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah, food in general tastes different. You know, it's uh, just like on board, I don't know if it's true, you know, but you say airline passengers also, you know, that's why they, they like to drink Bloody Marys because they like something spicier uh, because your, your sense of taste changes. And it's the same in space, yeah. Especially astronauts like to put more salt on it because they say it's the flavor kind of disappears when you're in space. Yeah. Did, did you, when you slept aboard the, the in space, did you give it like, what is it like? like, like <laughs> yeah, let me see if here. So I have a, a, a video I'll show. So it's in, in Danish, but there's English subtitles. I'll I'll speed it up a little bit. So this is, let me... Let me uh, reduce the volume a little bit. There's no need to... So I'm giving a tour in Danish of the... So this is the Columbus Laboratory, one of the modules. So this is the European module. This is where I spent most of my time on board the space station. Um, as I said, I brought up a new spacecraft. So when I was up there, we were nine people um, and there was only six sleeping areas. So I had to camp out basically. Uh, and that's why I'm gonna show where I'm sleeping. I decided to sleep in here because this is where I was gonna work anyway. Um, and so I just kind of had to find a, uh, a free spot uh, in this module to, to sleep. 
um, which is not that bad. Um, you know, there's no such thing as up and down. So I found a spot uh, on, the, on the ceiling uh, to sleep. And so there's my sleeping bag. And that's how I slept at night. But you see, it looks, when you look at it from this angle, it looks weird. But then, you know, once you're up there and you just, you kind of give your, your brain a chance to get used to the idea of you're now on the ceiling, then suddenly everything kind of looks normal again. Um, and that's where I would sleep in my sleeping bag. Yeah. But yeah, I, I had no issues fall, falling asleep. I mean, I, I was exhausted every day. So I just fell asleep and slept and, and then ice machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a, we now have a, like a small refrigerator so we can keep things cold. But, uh, you know, when I was up there, we didn't even have like a dedicated fridge for, for food. We sometimes were allowed to sneak things into the scientific fridge. And do they bring up those treats? On yeah, yeah. So every time there's a cargo vehicle, um, they'll, they'll, if there's room, they'll include some, some treats for the astronauts, especially uh, like fresh fruit. Because yeah. all our food is, is, is long duration food. You know, dehydrated or or in tin tins. So, is an orange space safe or is that too messy? No, no, we have I yeah oranges. We have oranges, but yeah, you have to be careful. I, I mean the, the 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 area where we eat, it's it's obvious. You know, there's ketchup stains around. <laughs> it's things float away very easily. Yeah. I did. I had a terrible experience playing with water. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, if you've ever fought, seen some of these videos, especially, uh, you know, with water, a lot of astronauts like to demonstrate water. Um, and so what, during my mission, there had been a, a competition in Denmark for students to uh, come up with experiments for me to do. And, and so two, two students had one this competition and they had both suggested an experiment with water uh, and just in in the planning of my mission it happened to to be on like the second or third day and so you know i'm i'm only on my second or third day in space i'm still getting used to being weightless you know you have to you have to get used to it it's 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 not always even though it's very easy to move it's also very um you don't do it very efficiently you know when you get up there to begin with you you're kind of like a monkey you know you hold on and you push and then you grab on and you push and you grab on um but that means you can't carry anything with you for example and so um it's much much better if you can you know once you get good enough to use your toes and so you like you'll see the like satoshi in that video you know he let go and he did like a backflip without hitting anything that's not something you learn within the first week or two and so i was still getting getting used to being weightless in space and i had to do this experiment with water on my second or third day and and yeah at some point the water just went everywhere <laughs> you know it's it's very hard to to manage it uh until you i mean the videos oh you you have a towel and you try to <laughs> you try to capture it or at least prevent it from hitting any electronic stuff but yeah, you see some of the videos, uh, it's very impressive how, you know, how they're able to control the water. It, they make it look much easier than it is. Like a liter of water? How much, how much water? Oh, maybe a, a, you know, that I was working with? Yeah. Like a baseball size. Okay. Yeah. But then it's something, you know, yeah, I mean, but water moves. It's like, you know, and then suddenly it splits into two and you're like, what, what do I do now? You know? <laughs> You, you try to blow it back together. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not that easy. Uh, uh. I think you operate this robot on Mars uh, from ISS. 
Yeah. Uh, how was it? Uh, how did it go? So this was another uh, technology demonstration uh, experiment that I worked with. You know, you know, we we kind of imagine that robots are going to play a, a bigger role in the future when we go to the moon and we go to Mars. Uh, you know, we'll I you know we'll probably be using rovers. Uh, to help with the exploration. And so we, we think, you know, astronauts will be maybe in orbit about the moon or Mars or even on the surface controlling robots. And so this was an experiment to, to, to help develop some of that technology where an astronaut, for example, in orbit about the moon or Mars is controlling a, a robot on the surface. Yeah. Was it because uh, the, uh, was the uh, time delay on the So what was interesting about it was it, uh, it involved force feedback. So normally, when we control uh, the space station robotic arm, this 17 meter long uh, robotic arm, it's you know it's like playing a video game. You have your joystick and you're controlling it, but you don't really you don't get any uh, feedback on the forces, right? So things like you know if you if, you know screwing in you know screwing in a screw can be very very difficult because you you don't get that you you don't have that tactile feedback of whether or not the threads are properly engaged. So you don't know if you're offset a little bit, you know, you don't, when you're doing it with a robotic arm, you have no idea. You're just kind of eyeing it and hoping that you're perfectly aligned. Whereas if you're doing it here on earth, you know, you could feel immediately if the threads are, uh, or if the screw is misthreaded. And so this, this uh, experiment I was working on uh, gave uh, a sense of that, that touchback. So when I was controlling it, I could feel in the joystick, for example, the resistance that I was meeting. And that's a, 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 an interesting technology that, that we're developing. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions? All right. Well, I think we could go on for hours and hours. You know, when, when we set this up, you know, we were talking about maybe, you know, an hour or so. And uh, this, is, this is, I mean, about as amazing as it gets for me. I, you know, you said you didn't have any trouble falling asleep. I think nobody fell asleep here today. Uh, that was really, really awesome. And, you know, hearing so many questions just shows that, you know, people are interested in what you guys do. And, uh, you know, it, it's so a humbling feeling to, to have somebody around like you and, and work together with you. And you're going to be up there one day again. And we'll all watch on TV and say, this guy was here in Goodyear in our little FNPT room and gave us a private, uh, presentation of that that was that was really awesome so we appreciate you oh and, um, my pleasure we learned a lot i think and uh hopefully you know we'll see you someday out there and uh, maybe, hopefully yeah uh... maybe we'll, we'll wave <laughs> yeah to the crowd you know you have international <laughs> visitors from all over the place so yeah. all right uh, one thing that i that i will say though if you didn't puke on that chair maybe this week or maybe <laughs> week, I'll, I'll make that uh, <laughs> the other chair so you, you gave me a challenge there, okay <laughs> Good deal. Well, thanks you guys for coming out here. Yeah. Thanks for your Thank time. You for right um, and uh, we'll, we'll see you around and uh, shake hands. Thank yep. you. No, my pleasure. Thanks. All right. I, I have a million and a half more questions. <laughs> I'm so surprised that there's there's a clean smell after hey all that years and the body odor and all the other yeah but but the thing is you right we spent we spent 53 hours in a capsule three guys together right so, so your nose is like blown out yeah <laughs> right it's <laughs> we're we're already used to the worst smell. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a yeah. Uh,